Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the AMREP effect. Okay, so we're just having a quick review of um, the principles of excitation contraction coupling within cardiomyocytes. Okay, right. So, we've now discussed the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Uh, and by the way, it's also often uh, abbreviated to the dihydropyridine receptor, the DHPR for short. And um, that's because these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels are susceptible to being blocked by uh, dihydropyridine drugs such as nifedipine. Okay, right. So... What's going to happen is when the action potential propagates along this membrane, it will lead to a depolarization uh, of the electrical potential difference across this membrane. Now, this calcium channel is a voltage-gated calcium channel, so it will be activated by the depolarization to open. Okay, so it's now open and it will allow calcium ions to move through it. Now, the usual concentration of calcium in the extracellular fluid is around 1.5 millimolar whereas the concentration of calcium in the intracellular fluid is around 100 nanomolar. That's a 15,000-fold gradient, so really calcium is only going to move one way when you open this channel. Just the probability that a calcium ion will hit uh, the extracellular side of this channel and go in is 15,000 times bigger than the probability that a calcium ion will hit the intracellular side and go out. So you're going to get a net movement of calcium in. So calcium is going to come in. Now, what happens is you have structures known as calcium synapses within uh, the um, cardiomyocyte. So what you'll have is you'll have a little projection, basically, like this, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here's this intracellular organelle, and here maybe is another projection like this. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is an organelle within uh, the cardiomyocyte, and it's basically very similar to the endoplasmic reticulum in normal cells. And it basically uh, pervades, well, it's, it's, it spans the whole of the cytoplasm of the cell and forms these sort of synapses with the cell membrane where it has these processes which connect up to the cell membrane. And these are probably better illustrations of this than this one here. This one here is very drawn very far away simply because I've put all of this nonsense here. Uh, but it should be nice up and close to the membrane like these two. Okay, so this concept of um, the... Um, calcium coming through uh, the um, cell membrane here, diffusing across this little bit of space here and acting on receptors on this uh, SR membrane here. This is the concept of a calcium synapse, and you'll see how similar it is to uh, synapses between neurons. Okay, right. So, um, in the SR membrane, then, the, is a receptor for calcium. So, I will draw this here. Okay, so this is the receptor for calcium. Uh, I'll colour it in blue. Okay, and this receptor for calcium is the type 2 ryanodine receptor. So in blue, this is the type 2 ryanodine receptor, often abbreviated to RYR2. RY for ryanodine, R for receptor, and then 2 for type 2. So I'll write its full name. Um, I'll write its full name in this space up here. So it is the type 2 ryanodine receptor, and it is sensitive to calcium, ryanodine receptor. Okay, and this is a really important concept. Basically, uh, the action potential propagating along the cardiomyocyte membrane is going to cause calcium to come in through this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And the little rise in calcium that you get around the L-type voltage-gated cal calcium channel, this little calcium signal is what's known as a calcium sparklet. Okay? Now, these calcium sparklets that are coming through L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, they are not big enough to actually cause uh, the cardiomyocyte to contract. Okay? So, it is not calcium entering from the uh, extracellular fluid that causes the contraction in cardiomyocytes. 
Instead, what's going to happen is you're going to amplify the calcium signal. So the calcium is going to act on these type 2 ryanodine receptors, and it's going to then lead to these type 2 ryanodine receptors opening and releasing calcium from the SR, which is a intracellular store of calcium. So this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it has a high level of calcium within it. So when the type 2 ranadine receptor opens, calcium can then leave the SR and go into the cytoplasm. And this rising calcium out of the um, type 2 ranadine receptors, this is known as a, well, actually on this side, it's known as a calcium spark, okay? So calcium spark LUTs are the rise in calcium that comes from the extracellular fluid through these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. And the rise in calcium that you that actually causes the contraction uh, comes from these calcium sparks which come out of the type 2 ranadine receptors. But what triggered the calcium sparks? Well, basically, it's this calcium that came from the calcium sparklets. So the calcium coming through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels diffuses across this space, and this space, by the way, within the calcium synapse. This is known as the dyadic cleft, just like the synaptic cleft in between neurons. This is the dyadic cleft within a calcium synapse. Okay, and the calcium acts on the type 2 ranadine receptors and causes what's known as calcium-induced calcium release. Okay, and that's, the name's pretty sensible because it's calcium release that is caused by uh, calcium, basically. Okay, and you'll also see calcium-induced calcium release, often abbreviated to CICR, like that. So either of those uh, things know what that means. Right, so overall then now, calcium has been released from the SR lumen. And I'll just make one last little comment about this, which is that when you release the calcium from the SR, calcium will go up in the vicinity of the type 2 reanidine receptor, and it will also go down on the inside of the SR. And that reduction in calcium on the side of the SR is known as a calcium scrap, just to add that little bit of knowledge there, which is just spark almost spelled backwards. So if you turn this park backwards, you get crap. Well, oh, sorry. Um, uh, so it turns into um, calcium scrap. Right. Okay, so... Um, What's going to happen then is all of this calcium that's being released from the SR, this is what will cause contraction in the cardiomyocyte. Okay, so calcium comes out, causes a global calcium signal that's going up everywhere in this cardiomyocyte. That will cause contraction of the cardiomyocyte by activating the sarcomeres. Let's now discuss how we remove the calcium signal, because in order to relax the sarcomeres back down, we need to remove the calcium signal. So, when calcium goes up, basically, reanidine is a complicated receptor. We've seen how reanidine receptors will be activated by calcium. So calcium coming in through these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels will cause calcium-induced calcium release from the type 2 reanidine receptors. So at low levels of calcium, calcium binding to the reanidine receptor type 2 will cause it to open. Okay, so if we draw a little graph of this on the... Oh, I don't really want to go into the next page. Um, I'm going to have to. Okay, right, so let's draw a little graph here. So, let's draw calcium concentration, okay, versus activation of the type 2 ranadine receptor. So, activation, I'll just put activation, but it means that I'll write of ranadine receptor type 2, RYR2. Right, so, we know at very low levels of calcium, the type 2 ranadine receptor is not going to be activated because there's no calcium, basically. Then as calcium goes up, in the levels that you'll get coming from the calcium sparklet to the type 2 ranadine receptor, the activation turns on. But then, as calcium goes up too high, it starts having the opposite effects. So you have this normal distribution-like structure, this bell-shaped curve, like so. So if you have 
calcium in the level of the calcium sparklet, somewhere down here, it will cause activation of the type 2 uranidine receptor. But as the calcium gets too high in the vicinity of the type 2 uranidine receptor, it causes it to close. So, why is this physiologically important? Well, if we go back to our picture, as the calcium is continually released from the SR, what's going to happen? Calcium in the vicinity of this type 2 uranidine receptor is going to get very high, and that's going to start inhibiting the type 2 uranidine receptor. So the type 2 uranidine receptors start to close after a while. So the release of calcium from the SR is going to stop. In addition, once the action potential has passed, then the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels will close as well. So all of these are closing, and all of these are closing. So the release of calcium from the SR has stopped. The entry of calcium from the extracellular fluid has stopped. What's going to happen now? How is this calcium signal cleared? Well, there are many mechanisms for doing this. There are three that I want to talk about. So, we'll start off with the most important. Basically, we have released a humongous great amount of calcium from the SR. So we want to return it back to the SR, because if we don't, we're not going to have enough calcium in the SR to do the process again, because the cardiomyocyte has to contract continuously, basically. So it needs to have this SR calcium level restored to what it was initially, so that it can then undergo uh, contraction in the next cardiac cycle. So we have a pump, basically, in the membrane of the SR, which I'll color in red, okay, known as the circa pump, and I'll um, write its name on the next page. So we'll go over onto the next page and discuss the circa pump. So if this is the membrane of the SR here, then you'll have the circa pump here. So let me just color it in red. More important than writing its name, I think. Okay, so let's write its name now. So it's the circa pump then. And circa stands for sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum. So sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. Endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. So what does this pump do? Well, we can see that it's an ATPA, so it's an active transporter. It's going to use the hydrolysis of ATP to do whatever it does. So, if this is the SR luminal side, so this is the SR lumen, okay, and this is the cytoplasmic side, then what circuit is going to do is it pumps two calcium ions back into uh, the um, lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and in exchange for that, it's going to move three hydrogen ions, three protons, out of the lumen of the SR. Now, it doesn't just do this exchange. Instead, it also has to couple this exchange to the hydrolysis of ATP. So, it breaks adenosine triphosphate down into adenosine diphosphate, and also an inorganic phosphate molecule there. So, it moves calcium back into the lumen of the SR, and in doing so, it hydrolyzes ATP. So it's actively transporting calcium back into the lumen of the SR. So once you've closed the type 2 uranidine receptors and also closed the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, Circa will be gradually pumping the calcium back into the SR. Now, this is what we want, because we need a high calcium level in the SR for our next beat to be strong, basically. Because if you have a high level of calcium in the SR, then the amount of calcium you'll release in the calcium sparks is going to be bigger. And if you release more calcium, you're going to get more uh, you're going to get the recruitment of a greater number of sarcomeres. So more sarcomeres will contract, and therefore you'll get a greater force. Okay? Right. However, there are two other uh, mechanisms that also remove calcium from the cytoplasm. And these are, if you like, the bad guys as far as getting a strong contraction from the cardiomyocyte is concerned. Because these are going to pump the calcium just onto the extracellular, into the extracellular fluid, which means that 
they're going to waste the calcium away, basically. They're going to lose it. It's going to go back to the outside of the cell rather than back into the SR. So there are two of these. So we'll start with uh, the PMCA. So here's the PMCA. So PMCA stands for plasma membrane calcium ATPase. So this is on the plasma membrane now, as its name suggests. Plasma membrane calcium ATPase. And basically, this is just um, a simple active transporter, which is going to pump a calcium ion out of the cell in exchange for um, hydrolyzing ATP. So one calcium is going to go out of the cell, and when it does that, it's going to hydrolyze ATP to adenosine diphosphate and uh, inorganic phosphate. So this is a mechanism for extruding calcium from the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, and another mechanism now, another pump here. Well, maybe not a pump this time. Not in, well, definitely not a pump this time. Instead, this other next. Uh, bad guy is what's known as the NCX and this stands for the sodium calcium exchanger so of course we're using natremium to mean sodium which is um, its Latin name probably it's the name that's used for in the periodic table okay sodium calcium exchanger so basically what this is going to do is it's going to bring in free sodium ions like so Okay, so free sodium ions come in, and A, calcium is extruded out, so it's secondary active transport. It's using the sodium gradient across the membrane, which is built up by the sodium-potassium pump, to extrude calcium. Okay, so both of these mechanisms are working to extrude calcium. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.